Welcome here, everybody. Um, my name is Jennifer Gaiman. I am a veteran homeschooling mother. I have actually been homeschooling. Well, I consider myself as starting homeschooling from the time my kids were born. I had met somebody um, when I was expecting my first who was homeschooling, and I thought that was just such a wild idea and something that I thought I might consider doing. So my kids uh, never went to school. My three oldest graduated from homeschool directly into their post-secondary. My oldest did a year at U of W before she transferred into a Red River program. The dean at Red River had let us know that it was hard to get in, and so um, it might benefit her to do uh, a couple of courses at the university before applying there, and she did. She actually uh, earned enough scholarships not to have to pay for her second year at the program. My next daughter, she went from homeschool to uh, Tech Voc, has an uh, after high school program for their technical vocational program. And so she did a year of photography there where she went on to win the national skills competition for her photography. And then she went to U of W where she is currently studying an honors creative writing degree. My third child, um, Josh, I always said if I hadn't been homeschooling my older two, I would have been homeschooling him. He would have, um, he would have struggled immensely in the system. He actually has some severe learning disabilities. And uh, I didn't actually know that while we were homeschooling, but when he decided that he wanted to go to university, we knew that he would probably need to have some accommodations. So he had, we had him assessed at that time. I thought he would be home a little bit longer, but he decided that he wanted to go to university on time. And so he worked really hard his last year at home to um, get caught up as much as he could so that he could go to university. He does attend with accommodations. Uh, he has severe dysgraphia, slight dyslexia, and uh, executive functioning disorder are the main ones, uh, but he does not access his accommodations very often. He's doing an honors program in the theater department there. My next son is my science guy, and in grade 11, he decided that he didn't want to do his labs in the kitchen anymore. He wanted to do them in a real lab, so we went over to the local public high school and asked if he could take his math and science courses there, and the administration agreed, so he took math and science in his grade 11 year and did the rest of his homeschooling. And then for his grade 12 year, he decided that maybe he wanted to see if he could do all of his courses there and if the um, administration there would give him back credits so that he could graduate fully. And he did, he took nine credits that year and with the help of his guidance department was able to fill in some of his homeschool back credits. And so he graduated with a full diploma. He's my first student who officially graduated from high school, homeschool students don't actually graduate. They just kind of peter out their schooling and then move on into post-secondary. So he actually graduated and I have a 15-year-old who is still learning at home with me. So today I'm just going to kind of do a whirlwind tour uh, introduction to homeschooling. I know a lot of you are looking at homeschooling um, not because it's your primary choice but because you're feeling like it's the only choice that the current conditions are leaving you for. So this presentation is often for those who are interested in homeschooling as a primary choice so I've tried to adjust it a little bit. Uh, the six things I want to talk about a little bit are determining why you are homeschooling. And I know a lot of you are probably sitting at home being like, well, I know why I'm homeschooling because there's a pandemic, but I want to talk a little bit about other goals that um, you might find beneficial. I want you to think about what a school day might look like for your home. And um, for many of you coming from a traditional system, that may seem like it's pretty self-evident, but for those of us who have been home with our children for a long time, we know that that's not actually very self-evident once you get into the messiness of it. Where you can get your resources, um, how you notify the government, the legalities around it, trying to put it all together, and then creating some sort of support network for yourself. So I know most of you are wanting to homeschool because there's a pandemic going on, but other reasons that lots of people choose to homeschool is because homeschooling offers a unique and atypical learning experience. We can control a lot more of the content so that in the case of my son, who he was, he was very slow to read and very slow to write, I was able to help him progress in other areas, even though he struggled in those. So he didn't feel like he had to be held back in many of his courses because he wasn't capable of reading and writing. He was able to absorb content in other ways. To spend more time with your children, um, 
I know sometimes this doesn't sound like a benefit, but um, as mine are flying home, my one daughter just signed a lease on Thursday. My other daughter moved out a week before the pandemic started in March, and um, it, it it has been a blessing that I have been able to spend that much time with them, and um, and I I miss that that time in my life is done, and not that it's not that it's always easy. Uh, during the pandemic, there were six of us, five who were adults, or at least we're supposed to be adults. We didn't always act like it. Living together in each one space, and it's difficult and hard, but it it definitely has its positives. To help a lagging student, to protect your children from a negative atmosphere, obviously that's one of the primary things that a lot of parents are looking at right now, whether they're concerned about actually catching COVID-19 or they're just concerned about how alarming being in a room where there's masks and heightened awareness of a disease might affect their children. And of course, to allow for independent study and progression. So children who really are excited about a subject aren't held back by the limitations of a classroom or the majority of other students are able to move forward as they want. So, well, I know a lot of you are thinking that your, your, your goal for homeschooling is just to get through this period. I want, I want people to aware that there are a lot of other goals that, that can be a part of it or a lot of other benefits that you can maybe try focusing on when you're worried a little bit about what this might look like for you and your family. Um, so one of the other things to think about is just what your finished product might be. And I know for most of you, your finished product is just going to be to get through this time so that your students can go back to the public school system when you feel that it's safe to do so. And that's important to keep in mind because that's going to affect what style or resources you might choose to use. If, if your goal is just to provide a really rich environmental um, educational environment right now, then that might change a little bit what you might choose to do or not do. And this will make more sense when I talk a little bit about curriculum and resources. Um, it's good to imagine what you want for your children during their homeschooling experience. Are you just interested in them gaining factual knowledge? Are you looking to broaden their cultural respect? Are you looking to give them skills that might not be prevalent in the classroom, like public speech speaking? Are you in love with nature so that this would be an opportunity for you to um, spend a lot of time outdoors learning from nature? Are you interested in activism, in which case your kids can, you can really share that love with them? Are you wanting to focus on kindness and compassion? Are you wanting to look at logical reasoning skills? Are you wanting to introduce your children to peacemaking? These are all things that sometimes aren't an active part of the curriculum in school, and these can be an active part of your curriculum. So you don't just have to think about those basic skills, although if that's your goal, that's good, but you can dream big and think about what you would have wanted your own educational experience to be like and maybe what you can bring some of that to your children in this time. So while it's kind of a scary time and I know it's kind of a panicky time, it can also be, um, it can also be an opportunity for you to think outside the box about what you might want to do differently or what you could really gift your children with in this period, even if it's just for a sh few months or for the year. I will say that your primary goal when you're a teaching parent is to preserve relationship because our relationship with our children is the most important thing that we give them and it needs to trump our teaching relationship with them. I love this quote, I'm a big Winnie the Pooh fan, but Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered, yes, Piglet? Nothing, said Piglet, taking Pooh's paw. I just wanted to be sure of you. And that's what our children need from us. And so I think that as we're going into this, and I know many of you did remote schooling in the, in the spring, and I know many of you felt that that was a real um, tough thing to do, trying to get your kids to do work that they weren't interested in, or they were alarmed by. Um, everyone was trying to figure out how to use um, online learning platforms and connecting with their teachers. And it was just, 
it was so alarming and so confusing and so different in so many ways. I know a lot of parents struggle to help their children engage in learning in that time. And I think it's really important to remember that learning only happens when our children feel safe and attached to us. And so then our primary focus has to be on making sure they feel safe and attached to us because otherwise learning's not going to happen. And so when we're approaching learning, sometimes we really need to take a step back. And it was funny because I know everyone was schooling at home and I was taking a few media calls and uh, you know the reporters were saying well I guess not much is different for you because you're always schooling at home and I thought it was funny because we just put schooling on hold um, we suddenly had all of my young adults living at home full time, all of us in the house. It was scary. It was alarming. My daughter hadn't, my youngest daughter hadn't seen a lot of her, her older siblings for a while. And suddenly they were here home all the time and really no schooling got done in my home in March and April and May, no formal schooling. Anyways, there was a lot of, um, projects happening and a lot of sharing of documentaries and lots of memes and TikToks and, all of that that beautiful sharing that my my kids share with one another but for me the preservation of relationship was more important i need to focus on building a relationship with all of my kids making sure that the tension didn't get too high in the house that alarm wasn't too much and so so we didn't do any formal schooling and i think sometimes that we have to hold on to that that it's okay if we don't do school school today because we're all having a bad day and what can we do to just make this day an enjoyable day and does that mean that we just sit downstairs and watch documentaries all day or we watch um, blue planet green planet or bbc nature shows or, or whatever what can we do so that we're still taking in information but we're maybe doing it in a different way so now i'm going to um I want to change gears and talk a little bit about homeschool style, but I'm wondering if there are any questions about um, goals that you might have or if my speaking brought up any concerns. I'll wait a few minutes, see if there's any comments in the chat box, and if not, I'll just keep on going. So far, so good. Thank you, Kip. Yeah, I realize that the goals might not apply because many of you are, many of you are just feeling that this is what you need to do for your children's safety. So one of the things I'm seeing a little bit on the Facebook is lots of confusion around terminology and there's lots of lingo in the homeschool world. And that is certainly true. Um, and I know that um, if you're in the Facebook group, you saw that I pinned a post and one of the posts will lead you to a quiz that might help you identify your homeschool style. Because homeschooling is not generally school at home. And I think that what most of you who did remote schooling in the spring experience was school at home, where the home environment was sort of run like it was a classroom and the teachers were were trying to teach as if they were at a front of a classroom, but they were doing it through a computer and then giving their children. So they were teaching their lessons and then giving their children um, whatever responses they wanted their worksheets or, and the parents needed to supervise that. But homeschoolers mostly don't school that way. It is true that there are many homeschoolers who do do what we call school at home, and that's partly because they are hoping or expecting that their children will move back into the system. And so then they're wanting to maintain some sort of routine so that their children either uh, learn what schooling, traditional schooling looks like, or that they don't lose some of those benefits. Um, I think that remote learning ruined my relationship with my kids. I. I can totally, I can see where that would work because it put you in a very difficult position where you were trying to get your kids to do something that somebody else was asking them to do. And I, I, can, I can totally relate. I, I've had homeschooling moments that uh, left my relationship. Well, I'll be honest, my daughter, youngest daughter and I were trying to pick up a routine again. And um, she spent the afternoon and I spent the evening in tears two days ago about our math program. So I can totally relate to what it was like. And in this case, I think having that third party could have really frustrated everybody. 
But so school at home is not necessarily what homeschoolers look like. And there's actually the way people engage in home educating is as varied as the number of home educators that there are. So there is freedom to do it in however you want. And so generally, I think we call these styles. I don't know uh, approaches. So this is lingo that you're going to come across when you research. And it's, it's, it's just about how people think or what people think is important in how their children learn or what they want their children to learn. So that's going to guide what resources or curriculum they're going to use. So I sent to the quiz because the quiz has got, I think it's got like 40 questions. It's a lot of questions and they're definitely weighted, but um, might help people think a little bit about what they want for their schooling. So these are some of the big words that you will see used. So school at home, which we've talked about, and that's pretty much what it looks like is there are workbooks to do. Um, sometimes they come with teaching guides and the teaching guides will give you as the parent, the teaching parent, a lesson. And you, so you'll walk through the lesson. This is a lot of math programs or school at home programs. And so you'll do the lesson and then your child will respond in some way, filling out a worksheet or maybe creating some sort of project. Um, yes, I will try to see if I can track that down. The link and post it. So that's school at home. And then there's a type of schooling called classical schooling. And this is based on actually Greek ideas of how learning is done. This was very prevalent in the Victorian ages. It's built on a lot of classical literature. It, it's built on the idea that there are three levels of, of interacting with the world. And the first is called the grammar level. And it's all about the accruing of facts. And then the next level is the logic level. And that's where we learn to think about ideas and and to make a uh, logical reasoning happening and then the third level is called the rhetoric level and it's about our ability to give our ideas back to people to argue what we believe and so you'll find classical homeschooling a couple of years ago uh, there was a book called the well-trained mind it's available in both editions in our public library or it was and it's a step-by-step -step approach to what classical homeschooling is about it's usually quite an intense approach to homeschooling and then there's something called Charlotte Mason. Charlotte Mason was a 19th century educator who believed in the value of children as that she believed that children were born persons. That's the way she worded it. And that children would learn on their own if we merely put rich materials in front of them. She's also um, the same time, many of you may be familiar with Montessori school or there's Waldorf school. They're all believed in the value of a children uh, to be able to learn on their own when they're provided with rich materials. So part of that is then seeking out what constitutes rich materials and putting them in front of our children. At the opposite end of school at home is something called unschooling. Um, unschooling is a whole philosophical approach to how children learn and it basically believes that in a rich environment children will learn whatever it is they need to learn. They do not need curriculum, they do not need textbooks, they do not need workbooks, they just merely need to have someone in their life when they have a desire to learn something help them to find all of the resources they need to dive into that topic as deeply and as richly as they want. So unschooling for parents is not so much planning as it is the provision of whatever their children are interested in. It often goes along with uh, life learning. So it's just about engaging in everyday life and then learning what, you, what skills will you need to engage in whatever part of life you're engaging in. Unit studies is an approach to learning where you pick a theme and then you would just discover everything about that theme across the board. So if you were going to study bees, then you would look about the science of bees, the life cycle of bees. You would look at the history of bees, maybe the history of beekeeping. You might look at, uh, so you would maybe write a report on it. You might draw pictures about bees. You might figure out how to I'm trying to think of math activities for bees, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. So sometimes these come pre-packaged. You can buy a pre-packaged unit study and it will walk you through all of these cross uh, curricular activities that would include science, it would include social studies, it might include geography, it would include English activities, it would can include math activities, or you can yourself pick a theme and then you would just set out with your child to, what's the life 
the life cycle of a bee. Um, what history can we link up with studying bees? Or it could be, you could study a person, you could study a country, your unit study could be any, your theme could be anything that you wanted it to be. And then you would just look at all of the different subject areas and how you could do activities in those subject areas related to that theme. Project-based is a little bit the same way. You start off with a goal in mind. So let's say your, your son or daughter wanted to, um, raise guinea pigs. That was the project that they were interested in doing. And then you would set about, well, all the different ways that we can learn about what it means to raise guinea pigs. What would the, what are the city regulations around that or your community's regulations? What's the history of raising guinea pigs? And, but it, it has an end goal in mind. Um, and then of course, online learning, which can consist of any of these styles is learning that's done through the computer. So, like it can be overwhelming, I think, to engage in these. And these are just a, a slice of them. There's still a handful more of different approaches. And so you as a parent who may be returning your children to the schools when this is done may just want to do school at home. That may be all that you're all that you can wrap your mind around. But if you're a little bit more adventurous, you could think about moving out a little bit and thinking about how you might approach your education a little bit more radically, um, although for those of us who've been homeschooling, it doesn't feel radical. I think that's the last I have. Yeah, so are there any questions about style? I'm just going to find that link and post it. And I'll just give you all a couple seconds to Okay, here's the link. Maureen says, I feel like my style is a blend of multiple styles. Does that matter? And how do I figure out what style would, would work best for my children? Oh, that is so. So the link actually goes to something called eclectichomeschool.com. If I were to describe my own personal style, I would say that I was an eclectic homeschooler. And what that means is I pick and choose any of these based on my own personal preference, on my kid's preference, on the day of the week. Um, yeah, so you can be an eclectic. And one of the things that you can do, so I have always used a math program. I've always done school at home for math. It was the one thing um, in another life. I'm actually a math teacher. So for math, it was, it was important for me to try to keep up those skills. And not that we did it um, draconian, right? I mean, every day that we were doing school, we worked a little bit on whatever math curriculum we were working on. So I definitely would say I do school at home, th uh, math through school at home. I have a little whiteboard in my dining room. I would often give lessons um, just because that's how it worked for me and it seemed to work for my kids. But for other things like science, we have mostly unschooled science. We do a, read a lot of books. We watch a lot of documentaries. Yeah, it's been mostly following my kids' passion around that. And even my, um, my three oldest, well, my two oldest who were required at U of W to have science credits, even though they had done no formal science, we didn't do any textbooks, I didn't do any curriculum in high school, um, they did just fine in their general science courses at the university level. They actually, uh, there was some stuff that they were excited to go deeper about, but there was nothing that they hadn't encountered in all of our years of just watching great nature and documentary videos. So whereas history was probably a blend of the two, history, we tried to follow a, a, a four or five year rotation. So, you know, we did the ancients one year and then the next year we did medieval. And then the next year we did like the early um, start of the industrial revolution. And then the last year of the, the rotation, we tried to do modern history and then we just go back and do it again. So I kind of had a plan and we always used a spine. We used a program called the Well-Trained Mind when my kids were in elementary and the activity books. So that was, it wasn't school at home because it was a lot of reading and books and hands-on activities, but it wasn't interest led as much. I decided that this was just how we were going to go through history. And it certainly um, 
there was freedom. I've always let my kids have freedom. So if they wanted to spend six months learning about the Greeks and not as much time learning about the Sumerians, then that was fine with me. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah. So you can just find what works for you in individual subjects. Um, if you only had, like I had five, so I'm not sure that I could have offered one of them unit studies and one of them school at home and another one that way. So, but I, you know, I can see that working if you have two kids and you, one is really excited to do unit studies and one is more kind of a workbooky kind of person, you can definitely offer different approaches and styles that way. Does unschooling work for 12 year olds who used to go to public school? Yeah, so part of the thing about unschooling, and I, I will talk, you might encounter something called de-schooling, which is sometimes what homeschoolers will recommend to parents who are withdrawing their children from school, is to get out of the idea of thinking about what school looks like. And sometimes when parents withdraw, not during pandemic times, but when parents withdraw their children from public school because they're struggling with the school system, children are alarmed. And so then to go from a school system and then to go home and, and have to face schoolwork from a parent. And when our children really want for their parents to just love them unconditionally and they're fearful about their abilities to learn, it can be very, very stressful. And so one of the things that we do recommend is that parents consider de-schooling, which is unschooling for a period of time before you might gear back up into more formal schooling. And what that does is just give you a break about the expectations around what learning looks like. So would a 12-year-old, I, I think that you could quite successfully, if you wanted to really make sure you, you help your 12-year-old seek out what they're interested in learning. You can make a great plan with your 12 year old and then you could see what you're gonna do to equip your 12 year old to learn what that is. Knowing that if they were to move back into public school, there will be gaps. And I'm not, I, gaps are not a bad thing. Um, I often get, you know, well, what if they don't learn what they're supposed to learn? And the reality is, is that there's kind of an arbitrary set of conditions that children are expected to learn in public school. And that is not so much for the child as it is for a way to hold staff accountable to teaching. But there is no, there is no particular scientific reason that a child would learn about bees in grade three and the life cycle of plants in grade five. And I have to confess, I'm not actually familiar with the Manitoba curriculum at all because I, I, I don't usually follow it. So I don't even know if that's true, but that there is some arbitrary choosing of what gets taught when. And for anybody who is schooled in different provinces or even in different communities within the province, you're gonna find variations. So would unschooling work for a 12 year old who used to go to public school? It depends. If, if your 12 year old is just going to sit and play video games all day and I'm going to, there would be unschoolers who would say that was fine. My own personal comfort level was that would not be fine. I want for my children to be engaging in rich environments. If you're really interested in unschooling, there is an Unschooling Manitoba group and they're very good and they would definitely be able to give you lots of ideas, lots of resources and uh, a lot more support. But I certainly know that taking a more relaxed approach to schooling can be a really healthy for kids. Next question, I've been looking at online school options, virtual elementary and out school. Have you had any experience with either of these? Is there a style you'd recommend? Um, I've never actually heard of virtual elementary school. I, I have heard of out school. I actually have some homeschool friends who teach courses on out school. So out school is going to look a little bit like what some of your remote learning did, where there are people who are passionate about offering their ideas and they run little virtual classrooms and teaching. I I think that the success of that will depend on the instructor. I know that OutSchool has, I think it's got a rating system and so you might want to check in to the rating system and, and check out what courses. Online can definitely work and there are lots of families that use it. I think though that the, the thing is that, that you are still the teaching parent and a child still needs to have a parent who is excited to be learning with them. And so for me, 
I, I even know with my students, my university students who were moved to online learning in the in the spring, they still wanted, they didn't get to talk to their profs. They didn't get to talk to their classmates about what they were learning. And so I learned a lot about first year biogenetics because I had a son who wanted to talk about what he was learning about and share some of his interesting ideas more so than when he was out and about in meeting with people. And I think that's true with our kids at home. They they want to have somebody who understands what they're learning and engages with them. So yeah, online learning can work. It's not something that I've generally used. It didn't exist when I first started homeschooling. And, and yeah, but I, I have heard good things about out school. And we did in our own homeschool co-op, we did a little bit of online learning in the spring. And uh, some of the sessions worked really well and some didn't. It kind of depended on on what the session was, some things translate better to online than others. I'm afraid of gaps. Everyone's afraid of gaps. Uh, so true story, two days ago, my daughter said something about um, one of the, her coworkers, she has her own, um, she has her, she runs her own little company and she does, um, she does social media. And for the, this uh, new client that she has, they're out of a white horse. And she was just fascinated. They were talking about some of the differences in where they live. And my son pipes up and he's like, where's white horse again? And a piece of me was just like, how did I miss teaching you the capital cities of Canada? But I know we did them. We actually did them online. There was a little app program that they used to use and they dropped them all in. And so I, I know that we did them. I, I there are going to be gaps. I, I, I expect that none of us remember what we did in our grade three year. And so the secret about gaps is how we respond to them when we find them. And if we're, he was like Googling it all and trying to figure out and he knew it was one of the territories. And so we live in a time and place where it's exciting that we can find the knowledge that we seek immediately. We don't have to go to a library or depend on somebody else to have the knowledge for us. So there are going to be gaps, but there's going to be gaps for public school children compared to homeschool children. My homeschool children learned lots of things that public school wasn't able to engage in. And so everybody has gaps and all we need to do is, is remember that it's about what we do when we find the gaps. There is no testing that happens for homeschool students, so it's not like they have to pass an exam or a test at the end. There, there is testing that will happen in, if you're, it's uh, standardized testing in Manitoba happens in grade three, and then uh, I think it's math in grade seven and English in grade eight, but I could have those backwards. And then of course there are grade 12s. So if you have a child that's gonna be going in and is gonna be facing some of those tests, then their, their, their grades may not reflect what they actually know, but it's not the end of the world. And, you know, if they're back in school, teachers are supposed to try and find those gaps as well. Gaps happen everywhere. They happen in public school. They happen in homeschool. I, I don't know much more to say, except they do happen and that's okay. It's okay. Uh, what's the best idea for a child with ADHD? I think um, my son has attention deficit disorder as well. He just really needed active. He needed lots of active. And I combine that with the fact that he has severe dysgraphia, which is an inability to write. And the boy could not sit for, for two minutes. So I used to do a lot of reading aloud. That's a, our primary mode of education is through books and reading aloud and audiobooks. And he'd just be climbing the walls. And I had to learn to read while there was a lot of noise happening. And so I, I think the thing about ADHD is really making sure that they're active when they're learning. The other thing is when um, ADHD is actually related to alarm in the brain. And so I think when our kids are really alarmed, that's sometimes when their attention, the, you know, the alarm system hijack, hijacks our attention is what happens. And so it's about creating a space where they feel really comfortable, where they feel really good about what they're learning. Um, just really making space for the uniqueness, allowing them, and short lessons. It's okay to do short lessons, you know, and come back to it. If we're only going to do 10 minutes of math now, and then we're going to do 10 minutes of math later on, or trying to figure out when it's best. We always did, um, we always did breakfast, and then I always did a connection time. So we always used to read a, read a book together, and then we would do math, and I'd get it out of the way, because I knew they needed to be bright, they needed to be well-fed, they needed to have 
filled up on loves and hugs. And then we could do this thing that nobody was really excited about doing. And then we could get on with the rest of our day. How to build a routine while unschooling. Oh, okay. I'm going to come back to the routine question. So I'll leave that one for now. Uh, which subject in your opinion are best or would be suitable to be done in an online setting for a third grader? And which subjects would you suggest doing a more one-on-one -on -one type of learning with the parent? I think this is really individual. I know that um, I have really found that my kids need for me to sit beside them to do math, even with my um, 15 year old right now, it still goes better when I sit beside her and we walk through a lesson together. Whereas my kids were much more independent about their science. They were much more willing to read books and then come and um, discover art is something that my kids have all done independently. So yeah, would, and, and some of homeschooling, unfortunately, is trial and error, which is really hard when you're just looking at a short time to homeschool, you know, like I would get a curriculum and use it for a year and then be like, this is not, this is not working. We did not like this. And so then would change to something else. So there's going to be a little bit of trial and error. And, and maybe before you invest large amounts of money, you can see if you can try things on for free or the library is a great resource. For those kinds of things yeah so but maybe you know if you and your child can't figure out how to do math together then maybe hiring a tutor online to do that might work for you i do have a friend that's been her experience she does a fun subjects and she pays for a tutor to do um writing and 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 now her kids are in middle years but writing and math because that's just easier she they won't fight they'll fight with her but they won't fight with the tutor um, audiobooks was a good, oh no, oh goodness, my son, um, he, he really struggles with reading. Audiobooks is what gets us through in my house. Nothing wrong with audiobooks at all. I, I think it's good too for my kids to read and we would really work on trying to do enough reading skills so I'd have them read aloud to me just to make sure. But yeah, no, we're all about the audiobooks here. Okay. I think it was good. So um, our next slide is about acquiring your resources. So once you have an idea of kind of what you're interested in, then you need to think about what purchases you might make or where you're gonna try to find your online or inexpensive or free resources. So there are a couple of different approaches to this. The first is a complete curricula. And there are some places where you can, you know, they send you everything in a box and you open it up and it has an instructor's guide. I'm, um, Bookshark is one, it's a literature-based one. And, and it includes, it's kind of a unit study approach. So it includes everything that you're supposed to do on day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Um, and that's called out of the box often is one of the words we use. And it tries to cover everything. Most math curricula are done separately. It's, it's very difficult to get. There are a few places. There's also um, a difference if you're schooling from a faith-based perspective. So there's a lot of Christian homeschoolers and they've been active for a long time and they have a lot of programs and materials out there. Secular homeschooling has been a little bit more underground and um, it's just really only within the last 10 years that I've seen the secular community really start to shine as people could um, meet together online. So that's also going to affect what uh, you choose. I, I'm not familiar with uh, Christian homeschooling resources as much. So I know that there are lots of those that have these complete curricula and and uh, if, if you if you are interested in homeschooling from a Christian perspective, there's the Manitoba Association for Christian Homeschoolers, and there's they they know all about this stuff. I'm more about the secular side of things, and so there's there's a few complete curricula for secular, but not quite as many options. So that's something to just keep in the back of your mind as you're looking for resources. And of course, if you're unschooling, then your resources are going to be much more. Um, life oriented. They're going to be your kitchen. They're going to be books that you're going to get. They're going to be projects that you might engage in. So you're probably not going to be buying textbooks or workbooks for that. Although I know of a lot of unschooling families whose kids like to go through the workbooks. It, they're just workbooky type kids. And so parents will buy workbooks to help their kids um, fill that need. Um, what most of us do is take an eclectic approach. So we'll look at science. In Manitoba, we are required to teach uh, language arts, math, social studies, and science. Those are the four. And then your 
any electives that you choose. And so what most of us will do is look at those four subject areas and find resources within that subject area. So we'll look for a grade two social studies curriculum or program or approach. Uh, Stay open-minded, and but be willing to switch. You know, if you look at something and it doesn't work, sometimes you can get samples, so you can do one or two lessons with your kids, and if it doesn't work. But sometimes you need to have consistency, because sometimes it may not be that it's the curriculum that's slogging away. It could be that it's the... Uh, the routine that needs time because sometimes we spring both on a child right we spring a new math program and we spring a new routine and it's sometimes uncertain what to do and I think that's a lot of what happened in the spring with remote schooling is children suddenly had a new approach to schooling and they had a new way that they had to do it and and they just didn't want to do it because it was all new and it was all alarming okay any questions about the resources? Okay. The resources is huge. It's a huge discussion. So most of you have heard about the Manitoba curriculum. It's what your children are following. We are not required as homeschoolers to follow the Manitoba curriculum. You are more than welcome to. All those documents are available online. All we are required to do legally is provide an equivalent education. And the definition of that is kind of uh, there's lots of wiggle room in what exactly an equivalent education looks like. So you can definitely look at the curriculum documents. The curriculum documents are not resources. They do not tell you what books to read or what lessons to use. They are a list of outcomes that a child is expected to achieve by the end of the year. And that achievement is usually graded as below, um, maintained, or above. So that's all it is and so in the younger years some of those achievements might be that a child would be expected to know their numbers from 1 to 10 at the older ages it can sometimes be a little bit more open like in high school they're expected to be able to present their ideas in a logical manner so sometimes the curriculum documents can be useful sometimes they cannot be useful if you are homeschooling high school the distance education courses are available to audit for free. That means that you ask for access to the PDFs and they send you the PDFs. And so you can work through those. Um, if you actually pay for the independent study options, then you get credits. I think those courses are about $350. They come with a teacher who guides your kids through and you get an official credit at the end of the course, but you can look at those documents for free. Um, I'm not sure if there are any more other questions around Manitoba curriculum or, or resources. I'm going to go back here. <coughs> Just scroll through um, questions that I missed. Which subject in your note read that one? March. Yeah, so about the podcast and audiobooks, obviously she needs reading skills, and if there's a way that you can figure out how to do those reading skills. <coughs> then it's good to do practice. Um, but definitely, if the point of the um, is to get some information and some learning, then podcasts and audiobooks. And actually, there's a lot of really good YouTube channels that um, my kids will come to me with some great YouTube channels that they follow. I think Vsauce is one of them. And my son, who's a biochem student, he has a whole bunch of mathematicians he follows on YouTube, and they're just little you know 10 or 15 minute little mini docs about things those those, are, those can be fantastic how to face and absorb the pressure from family for homeschooling for long term what's the level of independent studies um independent studies is grade 9 10 11 and 12. i don't know how many are there for grade 9 and they do have some um they do have some electives as well as the, I believe they offer English, they offer all three math levels. 
I think they do social studies to grade 12 and science. They're all on, I will try to post the a web page link for that. Um, how to absorb the pressure from family for homeschooling for the long term. Yeah, this this can be really tough. Um, I remember, I remember, you know, my mom was just so concerned that my kids were missing out on some of the fun side of being in school. And sometimes it's just, it's just knowing what you're doing and, you know, it's try to listen to them. It, it's often grandparents. And um, I do know that my, my friend Karen wrote an article about how her mother felt completely left out because she would get together with all of her retired folks and the retired folks would be talking about the concerts that they'd gone to at the school or the projects that they'd seen their kids or the science fair. And my friend's uh, mom wasn't having that experience and she felt left out. And so when she mentioned it to my friend, my friend was unable to think about, well, how can she include her mother in the homeschooling journey? And so then her mother started to be invited to homeschooling events or that, you know, she would, her, the kids would do a presentation and just have grandma over and then grandma could see the presentation. So sometimes some of the pressure or concerns that we hear from homeschooling parents is because they feel left out. This is completely alien to them. And, and how, how do we help them see, you know, the unfamiliar and be excited with it? Sometimes it's just knowing this is what I'm going to do and, um, and just really trusting in your own heart and hanging on to that. There are also studies around the benefits of homeschooling, um, how well homeschool kids do in post-secondary, uh, you know, homeschool children tend to volunteer more, they tend to be more politically active. Those studies, I'm in the process of adding them all to a web page on, um, on the manitobahomeschool.com. And so sometimes forwarding those um, helps a little bit. Do I have su suggestions for families? whose children are coming out of French immersion, French resources. It seems a lot of families are want to keep up. Yeah, this has been a huge discussion in the MASH group, and um, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. The individual schools ultimately get to decide who comes in and who doesn't. Um, uh, the, the, the DREF, which I, I have lost, but it's the Manitoba French resources uh, lending library, educational library for Francophone students in Manitoba. Um, if you are a notified homeschooling family, you can access those resources. So they have lots. We used to have one for um, English um, students, but the current government closed it uh, two years ago. But the French one is still open, and so you can access all sorts of French resources, both uh, educational ones like textbooks and workbooks um, from a library. You can't fill the workbooks out, but you can see them. Uh, you can also access audiobooks, you can access videos, you can access um, uh, books, like actual books, like uh, like fiction books, that, novels and picture books and all that. That's all available for homeschool families to access. I had seen that, uh, like I believe, uh, um, uh, uh, Alliance Francaise, I think, is offering courses. My understanding is that French immersion will only accept you back in if you can pass a placement test. So you have to be able to function at a like a grade five French level if they're going to admit you back into grade five French. But I think a lot of this is going to be new territories and it will be very much dependent on the individual schools how that looks. There is always late access French immersion as well. There are schools that take children in at grade six, seven, and eight. So this is an ongoing conversation. So I'm afraid I don't have a lot of firm information for you because it isn't something that has come up before. So I apologize. Um, There's certainly quite a few of us looking at it and trying to figure out what answers there are. I know that there's a number of people coming forward who are wanting to offer French tutoring as well. So maybe keep an eye out in the group for that. Um, I'm doing awesome. Thank you. <laughs> what are the extra costs new people may not be taking into consideration? Is it okay to change my mind on the type of curriculum within a month or two, even though it was documented? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you write on your form that you're using Jump Math and by January you've moved on to something else, you would just say in January that you've you know, you just say trying this program now or moved on to this program. It's totally okay that your plan does not survive contact with the enemy and you can change at any time. Um, 
yeah, within a month or two. I used to, I know one of the things I would do when I was looking at new curriculum, because some of the, those books and programs can cost a fair amount of money. I mean, if, you know, if it was 20 or $30, I might be okay. But if it was more than that, sometimes what I would do is print off the first couple of lessons, because there's often samples, and then try working that with my, my kids, especially if my kids were older, and see if they liked the format, if they liked the questions, and then that would give me a chance to see whether I wanted to buy it or not. The extra costs, the costs, um, there aren't any extra costs in the sense like hidden costs. The costs are merely what you're going to put out. Um, more printing. Um, we have a really good printer. That's one of the things that we invested in because I do a lot of printing of things, especially now where it's so much easier to get. Uh, you know, it's hard to pay for shipping from the United States, but so many people are offering programs out of the United States that you can download and print. So extra courses that you may want to take now now that things are moving online certainly those like the, we get no funding from the government at all so anything that you're going to pay for is going to be out of your own pocket but there are also so many free resources now like you can look online Khan Academy has an entire educational system that's free there's so many documentaries on on youtube you know if you don't have access to netflix or that if if you do have access to online um then yeah there's so much out there that you don't have to pay for your library card is an amazing resource not just hard copy but the library has audiobooks ebooks movies documentaries their online um, their digital collection is huge so yeah the costs are really as much as you want to to pay and is, you know, and can be as little as you're willing to be creative about. I hope that answers all your questions. Okay, public school students get a chance to learn word work, stitching, and other skills in grades seven and eight. Yes, so someone just posted in the thing that she's, uh, they've got her daughter the supplies, they found a little woodworking book and she's gonna learn woodworking at home. That is certainly, I know that they're, now this is all hard to do when uh, when COVID is happening, but there is a retired group of gentlemen who meet out of a community club in St. James who do woodworking and uh, they have welcomed homeschooling families to come in and do lessons for woodworking. Um, the, the online crafting community for sewing and embroidery and crochet and knitting is huge. I'm sure I, my husband is a woodworker himself, so he could speak more to the woodworking community. But I do know that there are, there are hundreds of people offering lessons and tutorials. I just signed up, um, I'm teaching myself crochet, and I just signed up for a free to make the little crochet stuffy animals and her little, it's a free introductory video. She has patterns and stuff on her page, but it looks very simple and very easy to follow. So I think that part of getting those skills is going to be you having to, to be creative. If you have um, older relatives who might have those skills and you're in a shared bubble, that might be something to look at or um, figure out how to do it online. If you have grandparents who are willing to try to teach those things online, I know that would be hard but lots of resources out there for for doing those at home and they don't have to learn how to do them in grade seven and eight either if you have a younger student or an older student how detailed does the curriculum on the form need to be um, it doesn't need to be detailed you do not have to add extra sheets I had at one point in time I was filling out five of them so I wrote one sentence down for every line um, I would just put um, my main resource that I was using, if, I, if it was child-led, then I would try to say, I might say that the topic we'd be looking, so we are studying uh, the Greeks and Romans this year, and we're going to use, I might actually specifically list a few books that I thought that we might read, and, and then I might say library or, or documents, or just the point is to let the homeschool liaisons know that you have a plan, that you've thought about the plan, and that your child is really going to engage in a rich learning environment. That's the point of it. So just a really well-worded sentence there should be fine. What to do for homeschoolers learning these skills, especially woodworking. I, I can't speak directly to that. I am sure there are, um, well, I know, I know there are books at the library. There's like two by four woodworking skills and it's how to make a chair from two by fours. I know because I just looked at it for doing outdoor work. So those, those resources are available. It, probably if you Google 
grade seven woodworking course or homeschool, look for woodworking homeschool course, you might find something that would be of help. Local support for the new community. How hard is it to find? Okay, I'm going to come back to support because it's on my list. The DREF. Oh, thank you very much for sharing the DREF website for French support. Yeah. And they often in the past, they have had a day or two where they invited homeschools to come, homeschoolers to come and see their facilities and have a tour of what was available. I'm sure that's not going to be available to us this fall, but generally the staff there have been very open to welcoming homeschoolers. Great corks out of Bronx on Henderson. Oh, yes, that's true. A lot of the homeschool divisions and probably even the leisure guide offer introductory courses, although there may be age restrictions. And of course, with uh, pandemic restrictions, some of those may not, may not happen in the same way. But normally, normally you could find, like when my kids wanted to do photography, my neighbor is actually a retired photographer and he, he was so excited. I asked him if he'd just come once a week for an hour and teach them a little bit about their camera. And that's all he did. He came for four weeks and taught my kids about the camera and I got him a six pack of beer as a thank you. Uh, sewing courses. Of the, yes, the leisure guide. Great. Okay. So. So now you have an idea of where to look for courses and resources. Some of this, you know, people are, this is where maybe the MASH Facebook group is helpful. You can ask for what people used or what they didn't use. You can Google. Um, I've linked to a few places where there is a whole listing of like secular resources for those who are really interested in, in looking at secular resources. If you're more interested in Christian, then there's lots. Uh, Kathy Duffy Review has a complete listing of everything, although probably not Canadian because it's American. So there's lots of places to go to find. I, I think that limiting your resources is actually the hugest problem. I don't think hugest is a word, but because there's just so many out there, there are just so many, and it's going to just be trying to narrow them down. Notifying the government. So you need to submit a notification package within 30 days of starting your homeschool or September 1st. So if you know now for sure that you're homeschooling, then you can fill out your form and send it at about September 1st. I have never ever once made the September 1st date, even though I knew I was going to homeschool. They're generally very gracious at the office. If you're not sure yet, if you're wanting to wait to find out what school's going to look like for your school, and I know a lot of schools actually haven't announced yet what it's going to look like, then you can wait. And then once you know, pull your child out and then you have 30 days to do that. If your child is in school and you do pull your child out of school, you'll want to let the, the school know because some of what happens is if the school is expecting your child to be there every day and they don't come every day, then they may initiate a report to the truancy office and you could get a knock on the door by a truant officer, although they're very busy as well. So that probably won't happen, but you would just let your school know. Sometimes schools, um, they will lose funding. Um, if it's before September 30th. So it's obviously in their best interest to do everything they can to convince you to stay. So a lot of parents sometimes feel like, I'm sorry, my clock is going off in the back. Um, it's in their best interest to try to convince you to stay. So sometimes they, a lot of parents say they feel pressured. Don't feel pressured, just say, this is okay. Um, you know, I, I know what I need to do. I've got my forms. I'm gonna fill them out and send them out. Uh, our school to inform them, like I said, you know, if the school is expecting your child to be there, then yes, you would call and let them know that you're going to homeschool. I, I don't know if you haven't officially registered. I'm not quite sure how that would work. It certainly doesn't hurt knowing that your schools right now are inundated with people calling. You could certainly send them an email to let them know that, that such and such won't be attending for, you know, this season that you have, you have, uh, you have, enrolled with the homeschooling office. It certainly wouldn't hurt. Uh, don't be afraid of the education plan. Write out what you plan on using, doing, or accomplishing. That's it. So if you're coming from a more unschooling, then you might want to write your, your September might be a little bit more thinner. You'll write out maybe your ideas that you're planning to engage in and the resources you might want to do. And then when you fill out your January and June report, yours may be more full that this is what you learned. This is what you studied. This is um, where you saw growth in your child. 
if you're doing more of a school at home and you've picked a curriculum, like if you're using jump math, um, I love jump math myself. If you're using jump math and that's what you'll write in the math section, you can just write jump math, grade, whatever. If you're using, mm, uh, you know, if you've put together a curriculum, so you're going to use Spelling City for your spelling and you're going to use uh, this book list that you found online. Um, Mensa has a, a great book list, so you're going to use the Mensa book list and you would just write those individual resources in like the language arts. And then under the last one for options, you might just want to say, you know, like my kids do swimming lessons, uh, which I think are supposed to be running this fall and um, they're doing some social distancing karate and so you can include those. Um, my daughter is doing choir online, so I'd, I'd say that, you know, she's with the Winnipeg Girls Choir online. I might not put the online part. But, and you just list those. So your January and June, they're just progress reports. So that's an opportunity for you to say how you think learning's happening in your house. Once again, you are not required to uh, put extra uh, pages if you want. There are some homeschoolers who, my friend uh, Karen, she keeps a journal. She's a radical unschooler. So she keeps a journal of what learning looks like every week in her in her home every week she writes down what her kids engaged in and how she saw them uh, grow and change and she actually just photocopies it and attaches that and sends that that in so there's lots of options and the the staff there they're quite um, amenable to to it looking differently for different families uh, there are actually samples of the reports on the website and I'm in the process uh, we used to have a newsletter that uh, we haven't been able to maintain um, because our volunteers, um, it's funny how kids graduate and move on and then people don't want to volunteer as homeschoolers anymore when they're not homeschooling. But um, we had a bunch of newsletters where we, we had samples, actual samples, and I'm in the process of tracking those down and I will upload those to the webpage this weekend. Uh, okay. So putting it all together, this is where someone had asked about routine. So once you know kind of what your style is, you've kind of put some resources together, you've let the government know what it's going to look like, then you need to create a routine and get, I, I think it's really important to get your kids in on the planning and implementation. I mean, if your kids are younger, but certainly if you have, you know, nine, 10, 11 year olds, and definitely your middle years and high school years, it's good to ask them, like, what time would they like to get up? And what are, what are they interested in it looking like? Um, my daughter right now, I've always done math first thing in the morning, but she's asked if we could do math after lunch. She's asked if we could have lunch together, and then we could do math right after lunch. And so that's kind of new to me, but that's what she requested. And she would like to spend her mornings a little bit more slow, you know, getting up, taking her time and and that's that's fine with me. We'll we'll make that work. So, but I think a routine is really important. And it doesn't have to be as a routine is not a schedule. I'm not I'm not good on schedules, but we always got up and then we would always have breakfast together. And sometimes that would be at 8 a.m. and sometimes that might not be until 1030, depending on how the day went. But we'd have breakfast together, and then like I said, we always read a book allowed together and then we always did our math together and then we would always take the dog for a walk and then we would always come back and do a little bit of seat work for English and then we would have lunch together and then the afternoon was always adventures. Um, I told someone that I use a loop schedule so we don't always do everything the same day. So I knew that, so my loop schedule would be like, so we're going to do history, we're going to do social studies and so if it was Monday afternoon we would do history and then maybe social studies if we were having a, a good day, although those are mostly the same. And then on Tuesday afternoon, then I would do science. And then on Wednesday, I might not get anything. And so Thursday might be our art. And then, so I, we might not do history every Monday afternoon, depending on what we did, but we would have this list of things. And then we would come back to the first thing on the list when we got around to it. So that was one of the ways. So my routine wasn't it wasn't history on Mondays. It was history when we'd done everything and came around back to history. Now, one season I did have a friend's son come and join us for history. He came every Monday afternoon. So every Monday afternoon we did history. That was part of our routine in that way. 
But I think having a routine set out and so that your kids know, especially if your kids have been in school where there is schedule, where this happens and then this happens and kids know what that routine looks like, it can be helpful for them to have some sense of what's coming up in the day. If you just suddenly get up and announce that we're going to be doing math, especially after a whole summer of not doing that, it, it's not it's probably not going to be beneficial or fun for anybody. So figuring out your routine, posting that routine, putting it in place, working with your kids to get one that works. Okay, questions again. I wonder if you could share, no. Does university accept homeschool kids? Yes, I'm going to leave that question for a bit. I will come back to it. What would you suggest in terms of schedule? Oh, I... Uh, I think that a lot of families are going to have to be really creative if you're both working from home and trying to school from home. I know that there's been some discussion about what that might look like. I've heard that uh, like generally a parent has to be readily available. The, the government, the homeschool liaisons require that a parent be readily available to help their child during their school hours. So that may mean that you and your partner need to figure out who's going to be on, who's going to be on call. If, you know, like my husband, my husband works from home. And so, I mean, he's available a lot of the time, but there are certain times when he'll come up and, and sometimes they're, they're mostly scheduled, but so then I know that he has an in in person, online, no, it's a, a live, synchronous, I think they're called now, a synchronous meeting every Monday and Wednesday at 10 a.m. So every Monday and Wednesday at 10 a.m. And he's had that for years. I made sure that nobody's interrupting him, that nobody's going to him. Like everyone knows that, that daddy's on a call and can't be interrupted during that time. And so I think for working families, that's what you're just going to have to figure out who's going to do what and then try to find a way to make that really work for your kids. I know my husband, we had a sign that we used to put on the door that would be don't disturb daddy. You know, the kids knew that they could go in there most of the time. His job does allow him to have some freedom, but when he was working with a client, then there would be a sign on the door that so that they know they couldn't go in. And yeah, I, <laughs> I wish I had more suggestions, but I think it's going to be a lot of trial and error and just trying to figure out what works for you. I do know that I've had seasons where, um, where I, it, you know, health wise, it wasn't working. And so, yeah, there was a fair amount of educational television that happened in my home. And this may be that sort of season for you where you may need to, you know, this is the snacks. This is the Netflix. Y'all just need to be down here. I used to pay my children sometimes. So there's five of them and there's 10 years between the oldest and the youngest. And I used to pay them all. So if everybody can be down here for an hour and be quiet with no arguing, everyone would get a toonie. Um, just because I just really needed them for to be down there and not be arguing and, and, and have them figure it and work it out themselves. So I think it's going to be maybe asking for suggestions from other families that are doing it and looking for some creative solutions. It's a great pressure on me about starting homeschooling. Oh, university admissions. Okay, let me just check and see what I got left here. Creating a support network. Okay, so I'll talk about university. Yeah, universities, so homeschool students do not officially graduate. They, they don't get any diplomas. There's nobody that says that they did what they did. They just stop homeschooling. That's what it looks like. Uh, universities um, accept homeschool students on an individual basis. Here in Manitoba, especially in Winnipeg, homes, the universities have been very accommodating to homeschool students. They do require a transcript, so a parent has to create a transcript that lists the courses and um, they have to have marks on them. So I had to figure out what sort of marking system that I was going to use. I do a whole workshop on how to do that. And then they have to have a portfolio that lists what um, those courses looked like. And so then the portfolio looks like if you're familiar with a university syllabus, that's sort of what they look like. So for math, I would actually just list all the chapters in the math textbook that they had completed. Uh, for math, I did do some testing. The uh, Manitoba uh, old Manitoba exams are online. And so I downloaded them and used them to give me an idea of what marks to use. But for the other ones, I kind of 
my kids and I negotiated what they thought learning looked like and for subjects that they were really passionate about that they'd done a lot of extra research I obviously gave them really good marks and for subjects that they hated and did not work on I did not they may have actually gotten higher marks had they been in school than what I gave them but um yeah, so the homeschools accept them. It's always important once you know where your child may be headed to contact the individual university and the department within the university to find out what they expect. So for example, U of M did not, I'm assuming it's the same, they do not accept uh, science credits. The science department does not accept homeschool science credits. So if you want to do direct entry into the faculty of science at U of M, you must have official Manitoba credits for science. And and then there are ways like that's one of the reasons my son ended up going over to the high school is because he wasn't sure where he wanted to go. He ended up going to U of W, which accepts and doesn't require their Department of Science doesn't require uh, official credits there. So I had a, my, my oldest daughter's young friend wanted to be in the faculty of engineering and her mom went to the dean of engineering and said, what do we have to do to make this happen? She was in grade nine, I think at the time, and that's where she was looking and she was able to do her, her humanities, were able to be homeschooled, but she was required to take her, her physics, uh, pre-calc, and I can't remember what else, but she did those through the collegiate and then was accepted into the engineering department. She had direct entry into the engineering department. Um, I had a young friend who wanted to go to a theater school in Ontario and they would not accept a homeschool student. So then he did what my son did. He found a high school in his catchment who was willing to work with him to back credit and so that he could get a complete diploma and then was able to go to his acting school. So it really does depend on the schools. My, my um, son with the learning disabilities is actually at university because he wanted to go to firefighting school and firefighting school wouldn't um, accept him with accommodations. And so he decided that he would go to university, figure out uh, how much he needed to use his accommodations. And it's still in his long-term plan, even though he loves what he's doing, it's still in his long-term plan that that's something that he'll be looking at once he graduates. So lots of options for homeschool students. Um, if you're a faith, uh, Canadian Mennonite University, which is a Christian based university actively seeks homeschoolers. So if, if you're somebody uh, from that faith, then then they want you there. They are um, doing what they can to get you there. So lots of options for, for graduates. I know um, we're having an online conference this year, but every fall we offer, uh, we usually offer an in person. And one of the highlights for the event is we always have a bunch of homeschool graduates come and they sit up on the front and we let parents ask them everything about what they did and what they didn't do and what they liked and what they didn't like and how it's going for them. And it's always a highlight for parents to see all of these amazing young adults. Um, portfolios from which grades? Um, they really, so the, um, they only wanna see grade nine, 10, 11, and 12. That is all universities are interested in. You do not have to keep any. The homeschool office asks you to keep a, you know, a sample of work done in each grade, but I would keep them until they started the next grade and then, and then um, declutter them. I checked them, but I told my kids we were just decluttering them. Independent studies have some credits for students. Yes, that's another way for you. If, if a faculty has said that you need an official credit, you could do the independent studies, either the um, paper versions or the online versions that they're offering now. They, most high schools have been willing to accommodate students. So like I said, my son only planned on doing the science credits. He did just do his science and math in grade 11, and he could have just done the science and math in grade 12, and then he could have gone accepted. That was his plan was to go to the U of M science program and having the official credits in the sciences would have allowed him to do that. Okay, so a support network. Um, the younger your children are, the more important a support network is for yourself. We often think that we want our kids to have friends and it's okay for kids to have friends, but honestly, what our kids need is attachment to us. That's what's, it's safe attachment with a parent that is going to promote their growth and development and maturation. And so in the early years, it's much more important that we um, maintain some level of, of sanity. Um, I, MASH is trying to figure out what this looks like in, um, 
during a pandemic when we can't get together, we always have a not back to school picnic. We do it the week after everyone's in school. We usually do it at the nature's playground. And it's just a beautiful time of a bunch of homeschool children who don't know each other running around and yelling and playing manhunt. And it's just a lot of fun. And we've done that for years. We always have a trip to the farm. There's a homeschooling family that runs a runs a, a farm that you can go and visit. And so that's something that MASH has always has done. We often offer events throughout the year. We, we had a dance party once. Um, there were a bunch of, well, when my kids were teens, they all wanted to have a dance. So we had a dance party. So there's all sorts of things that we're, we, we normally offer. I don't know what that looks like in the age of social distancing and online. I certainly know that there are a lot of online um, Facebook groups, uh, specialty groups. So if you're interested in unschooling or there's just the MASH group, the MASH group is huge right now. And I know it's inundated with a lot of new homeschoolers, but normally it's a place where we just chat and ask for advice. And it's, um, it's not quite as overwhelming with requests as it is right now, but there's lots of other groups. There's uh, smaller groups. Like I know there's a group for West Winnipeg and I know there's a North K group. And I saw that someone just posted that there's a Steinbeck group, the Westman out in Brandon. Uh, they have a really active group out there. Great group of people. Um, we've driven out there to be at their little mini conference. They drive in to be at our mini conference. It's a, just a great group of people out there. So if you're out in uh, Western Manitoba, I definitely, check into them. So there's lots that happens and there's lots of places. Um, sometimes what's also best is for you to try to find a couple other families, even when you're not social distancing, a couple other families that you know who might be doing this, um, just so you can you know, talk at the end of the evening about what a terrible day it was or share. We used to have a family, friends of ours homeschooled. They were out in Steinbach and once a month we used to drive out there. They would drive in here and we'd do a show and tell. And our kids would just do a show and tell of what they had been learning over the month. And it was, it was fun. It was fun to see my kids still talk about how their friend Jonathan, um, he had been learning about trapdoor spiders and he did a whole, it was a little bit like a, um, a modern dance of a trap, the story of the trap tales, trap door spider told in modern dance. My kids still talk about that particular presentation. So there's lots of ways for you to look for community and to make connections. There's kind of a joke in the homeschool community. Why do we call it homeschooling when we're never home? So when media always ask about socialization, it's not really a problem. I mean, Part of the problem I think that happens is that a lot of our children are peer dependent and that's not always healthy. And so homeschooling really offers an opportunity for us to create strong family ties, which can really serve our children going forward. But yeah, it can be tiring and it can be hard and we have bad days. Like I said, um, my daughter and I both spent two days ago in tears and I thought it was hilarious. I thought that she's in her bedroom crying because she thinks she's a failure at math. And I'm in my bedroom crying because I think I'm a failure at teaching math. <laughs> And so when I pointed that out, we kind of had a little bit of laugh about it. And then we sat down to figure out what we might do to solve our, our problem. But yeah, it's not always easy. It's hard. And so I think finding some place where you uh, can, you know, a group of people who would support you in the process is probably important. And MASH is trying to do that. But sometimes it has to be up to you to find what you're, what you're looking for and what that might look like for you. And I know that in... Um, September and October and probably into November, we are doing our conference online and rather than doing it all on one day online, because we all think that's too much time to be spending in front of a screen, we are going to be offering a session every Wednesday for those 10 weeks, I think it is. So that's something to look forward to. And we'll probably have a little Q&A time afterward so people can connect and check in. So a I think that's my whirlwind tour of how to homeschool. I hope I've answered most of the questions that you might have. Um, I'll wait a few minutes. I don't know. We can stop the recording now. And if people want to actually come up line and talk and chat, I'm willing to do that. If people are just exhausted, I always find just looking at flat faces is never really easy. If people just want to head out for the night, that's fine too. Um, like I said, we're going to post this so people can rewatch it again. I am trying to make myself available. Um, I'm not, we're, we're just sort of gearing up to homeschool in my home. So I have a little bit more time right now. I'm trying to make myself available on the MASH group to help people. It's a real passion for me 
to be able to encourage parents to offer alternative education if they want. I have seen how it has really worked for my children. I talk a lot about my son, Josh, because one of the things that I asked him about, uh, I always ask my kids, what's the best thing that you said about homeschooling? So I can let parents know that's what you thought. And the thing that my Josh said is, I'm going to get emotional. It's late. I'm tired. Um, he said that he didn't know he didn't read until he was 12 and he didn't write. He still doesn't write. Um, that's his severest disability is dysgraphia. But he didn't actually know that not reading was a problem. I managed to just provide enough space in his life and enough. It's okay, you'll get it. Or it's not a big deal or accommodate him as best we could. That he didn't realize that that was a problem. And so the fact that he goes into university now and, you know, he tells his professors. No, I, I can't physically write. He's not apologetic about it. He's like, this is the way it is. And this is what we can do to work around it. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to work around it. So let's figure out a plan and move forward. He's just so practical about it. And I really do think that that has been one of the greatest benefits of homeschooling. It's just been able to give him the time and the space that he needed to grow. And so that's one of the reasons I do this. And I, I'm a hope. I know many of you are just wanting to do it for a season, but I hope that that season can really bless you and your families while you're doing it. And I hope for those of you who are here, who are interested in maybe pursuing it long-term, that I can uh, help you acquire the skills that you need to do that. Thank you very much, Shireen. You're working hard behind the scenes to try to help you.